Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Todd Moss, uh, and welcome to the Center for Global Development. I'm uh, really thrilled to have a, a terrific program uh, this afternoon. Uh, as some of you may know, we have an initiative here called Oil to Cash, uh, which explores the potential for using cash transfers in oil-rich countries uh, as a means to promote uh, economic development, uh, political uh, development, and as one option among many that might be um, uh, a way for countries, particularly fragile countries, uh, to avoid some of the uh, downsides of what many people call the oil curse. Uh, Iraq is a country that we thought uh, is, is a, uh, one option. Um, um, back in 2004, I think, Nancy Birdsall and Arvind Subramanian actually wrote an article in Foreign Affairs called Saving Iraq, uh, uh, Saving Iraq from Its Oil, uh, which proposed something like this uh, in a very simple manner. Um, it didn't happen then. Uh, but as we continue to look at, uh, at the potential for cash transfers in oil-rich economies, uh, it started to look like maybe Iraq uh, was getting another opportunity to think about this option. Uh, and we were lucky to, to connect with Johnny West, um, who, who commissioned a really terrific paper called Iraq's Last Window, which is available in English and Arabic at the back and on our website. Um, and we asked Johnny to come. Um, uh, he's come uh, straight from Libya uh, to be with us today uh, to talk about um, his paper and, and the idea. And then we've got a, a really, um, a really terrific uh, panel that we're gonna. I'm gonna ask some questions at the end. We're not gonna do the standard uh, set presentations. Uh, what we'll do today is I'm gonna ask uh, Johnny West to talk for about 10 minutes just about the idea, and then I'll ask the panelists to to join us, and then I'll, we'll start the question and answer period right away. There are bios at the back, uh, but very quickly, um, I just want to introduce our panelists. We've got Johnny West, who's a longtime journalist in the Middle East and the founder of Open Oil. He also has a new book out called Karama, Travels Through the Arab Spring. Uh, and next month in Berlin, he'll be giving the TEDx, a TEDx talk on this idea of cash transfers in Iraq, so you can look for that online. Uh, then we're going to have uh, Peter McPherson, who many of you know is a former USAID administrator. Uh, for our purposes here today, um, his, his important uh, distinction is that he served as director for economic policy in Iraq uh, during the Co Coalition Provisional Authority. Uh, we also have Abdur Harim Fukara, who is the Washington Bureau Chief of Al Jazeera, and our good friend Andy Balkal, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary at the U.S. Treasury uh, for Middle East and Africa, who's the guy currently in the seat. Uh, so, with that, I'm going to uh, ask Johnny uh, to talk for, for 10 minutes. I think up here is fine so everyone yeah. can see, and okay. then we'll, we'll go to questions. Thanks. Okay. Um, thanks, Todd. So, um, I'm sure the questions will uh, bring out a lot of, um, um, you know, points about the uh, internal politics mechanisms of it. I'm just going to explain what the model is for now. Um, with Iraq, we've um, started from the um, fact that um, they're in, you know, full, uh, full steam towards fast rising production. Um, so they are headed towards, uh, and here, uh, each of these factors, you know, obviously there are parameters, optimistic scenario and pessimistic scenario, but even if you use very conservative assumptions, um, they are currently at. 2.8, 2.9 million barrels a day, um, but because of a bunch of uh, agreements struck 2009 and 10 with um, IOCs from a dozen different countries, that's looking like um, 4 million barrels a day by 2013, let's say, up to maybe 5 to 6. And then the consensus in the oil industry starts to break down about whether they're going to go up to the 12 as the government claims for internal consumption and you know, grand rhetoric, or, you know, seven to eight, and, you know, what Saudi and Iran think about that. But general background, you know, huge rising production, and, um, you know, no one it can really predict um, prices more than three years out, it seems to me, but we're still in a pretty stable uh, um, um, stable market for prices, so that, so that this year um, the government is likely to receive something in the region of $84 billion 
but that's going to, we're looking at that rising to 120, 130 billion. So that gives plenty of scope to say to, uh, for, for an Iraqi politician to keep government spending, public spending, both operating and capital, even uh, at, you know, 2011 levels, uh, or adjusting, you know, for per capita growth, which in Iraq is 2% roughly a year, and do a whole bunch of other stuff as well. So uh, the dividend lies in Iraq in this space, uh, in the increased production and the increased predicted revenue. So it, it, to be clear, it is not arguing that public spending should be dismantled in any way. Uh, in fact, government spending plans could continue roughly as they are. So what would the impact be? Um, and by the way, so doing that, you could begin a dividend, let's say, roughly this time next year at $200 a head per adult. I've posited it per adult as opposed to um, per citizen, which is another possible uh, model. Um, and then the surplus funds that you'd be dealing with if you're in this scenario where um, um, you were keeping government spending roughly level, uh, that could rise to well over $1,000 by 2015. Again, I stress this is using conservative assumptions on production rises and conservative assumptions on price, uh, which the World Bank and IMF typically you know, use very conservative assumptions. Um, so, what would the impact of that be? Um, I mean, there's a bunch of economic and developmental impacts, and there's a bunch of political impacts. Um, a lot of the discussion of around dividends, particularly in the South, tend to be on economic aspects of it. In my view, those are pertinent and important, but the political uh, uh, effects, I think, are uh, more, more strategic, more significant, greater. But in economic terms, poverty, um, the latest household survey in Iraq showed that poverty is widespread but shallow, um, so that... Um, uh, I think 22%, around the 20% mark of households fall below the national poverty line, uh, but the poverty gap isn't that big. Um, and what that predicts is that a dividend would quickly close that gap, um, even at relatively modest levels. So you'd have poverty reduction. Um, then, depending on how it's structured, and, uh, you know, CGD's done a whole bunch of work on how these things could be structured when you add in uh, biometric ID systems, uh, uh, mobile transfers, and so on. In other words, a fluidity of transaction um, that we're still not quite used to thinking about. Um, if you have that integrated delivery of a, of a dividend, then all kinds of other development policies are possible, uh, such as uh, domestic capital formation, uh, such as you know, encouraging savings mechanisms within the population as lar at large, such as extending the tax base. The uh, tax base within Iraq um, is uh, in the, the IMF um, Article 4 report uh, from 2010 puts it at about 2% of, of, uh, of government uh, revenue. Um, so all of those possibilities... Um, uh, and particularly extending taxation could be a significant step in turn uh, uh, to um, private sector diversification. It's, it simply depends. When you've got so much money sossing around, so in other words, the dividend, which is would be unconditional and universal, so that it's, the, it's predicated on right, which is actually enshrined in the Iraqi constitution. Um, the oil is defined as being the 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 uh, the owner, the sovereign, the Iraqi people are the sovereign owners of of the oil assets. So, so the dividend is X, but then uh, you're into the realm of nudge. You know, the government has uh, amazing potential there to say the X is 1.1 X if you want to put it into a college fund. It's 1.2 X if you want to put it into you know, a bank. Uh, Iraq is seriously underbanked. Um, I forget the figures that they're in the paper, but it, essentially you're dealing with uh, five to six hundred branches in the country as a whole, and uh, you know minuscule private sector lending. So there's a whole bunch of other development effects which could happen 
if the dividend were integrated. And I really think that's a point worth stressing because a lot of, uh, a lot of reaction to dividend is, oh, you want to you know, drive around in a truck and throw cash off the back. Is, and it's, we're just not in that world anymore. Uh, and that makes all of the difference. So that is the economic, uh, you know, a, a very quick tour of the economic impacts. Like I said, I believe the political uh, effect is much more significant. Um, Iraq, like many um, oil-dependent economies, has, um, you know, regional stresses and, um, you know, secessionist politics, not just with the Kurds, but recurrently and specifically with regard to the oil issue, um, amongst the southern provinces, which are where 70% of production currently is. Um, and, you know, while it would be, you know, it would be naive to say that all problems between centre and regions um, would be solved um, by, by a dividend, it reframes the debate for all issues. If you are, uh, uh, you know, particularly in Kurdistan, you know, um, Kurds under 30 by and large, no longer speak Arabic. Uh, they live in a, a region which has been autonomous for 20 years. Uh, it's a totally different uh, world, frankly. I mean, if you spend any time in Erbil compared to, compared to Baghdad or, or Basra. And there is now a, a very uh, well-established regional government, uh, which is in this complex symbiosis between you know, between Erbil and Baghdad, there's a lot of disagreement about a lot of issues, but at the same time, management of those issues. Nevertheless, you know, the, the relationship of the individual Kurdish citizen of Iraq living in KRG with the state of Iraq uh, would be, in my view, significantly changed um, if, if, if they are receiving a dividend as their right as a citizen of the state of Iraq alongside their fellow citizen from Anbar and their fellow citizen from, from Basra. So you have the kind of unification principle. Um, um, the Iraqi industry, oil industry, has, has been subject to massive uh, attacks um, from 2003 on, which dipped and are now, in these last few months, rising again. Uh, in the 2003 to 2009 period, it's quite difficult to disentangle what attacks were, you know, politically inspired or, you know, essentially extortion or a mixture of the two. Um, but the Beji refinery and the pipeline through from Kirkuk to Chehan get, you know, was, was getting blown up about once a week. Now we're seeing, we're now seeing that stuff starting to happen uh, with increasing intensity in the south. Um, but the dynamics of, you know, what it looks like, who you are when you want to blow up a pipeline and, you know, who your political constituency is, look very different if um, by blowing up the pipeline you're depriving your fellow citizens of money. You know, it's, it's very simple, really. It's all about stake. Um, but to conclude, I would say that fundamentally the reason why uh, the political... Uh, aspects I believe are, are, are more significant is it's about legitimacy. Now again, and a whole there's a whole set of questions about, you know, oh if you take money away from the, there's a, in my view a false equivalence between the amount of money at the disposal of a government which acts on behalf of a state and the legitimacy of that state um, by what is a modest dividend, you know, a very modest per percentage of government uh, revenue, you could massively increase legitimacy uh, the, and, and change the nature of the relationship between the citizen and the state. So this is not about weakening the state. It's, I think it's quite a depressing argument that the only relationship or the only variable in the relationship between the citizen and the state is the amount of money uh, transactions between them, and, and it's simply not true. Um, and the way I would encapsulate this is that the transparency initiatives in general, and this is what I work in, uh, the field I work in most of the time, you know, the last 20 years we've got, had a paradigm of transparency in which a lot of uh, very um, committed, smart people from many different institutions have been uh, working on a range of initiatives. We have the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. We have uh, technical assistance paradigms from within the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, we have you know, UNDP uh, doing quite a lot of stuff, and 
some progress has been made and there are more examples of countries using natural resource wealth better but really not that much you know for 20 years effort and I think it boils down to a very simple fact the number of people in Iraq and I know this because I've met them who are seriously engaged on tracking um, government use of revenues and corruption and transparency issues is actually pretty much no, slightly less than the number of people in this room now. Uh, 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 and, and, you know, under-resourced in, in every way compared to the resources available to people who are sitting on, on the oil wealth for one reason or another and working with patronage systems and politics. It really is less than the number of people in this room. I've been in that room with those people. I call this the garden party problem. but the And we will be stuck with the garden party um, problem until there's some way of giving people some real sense that they can have a say over, over um, how their oil wealth is spent. So in my view, the dividend, the, the, the money is, is the less important part of the dividend. The money is the signal. With the dividend comes, you know, a laminated card, you know, something that's in your wallet that's the size of a business card which gives you the breakdown of the rest of the spending. Now, of course, the government publishes such figures now, but who really thinks, who really believes them, whether they're true or not is another question, but who really believes them and who has any way of verifying whether that's true or not? It's less, the number of people who take up that challenge is less than the number of people in this room. So what we need to do is go from a garden party to a football stadium. And... Uh, so 15 million adults get their dividend with their scorecard. 1% of them are sufficiently you know, fired up by this to get involved in some way. That's 150,000. And a quarter of them do anything effective. That's a football stadium. And I just think the whole world of transparency and governance of, of oil money looks completely different when you've got a football stadium than when you've got a garden party. And that's what the dividend would do. Okay, I'd like to, to invite our, our other panelists uh, to join us, please. Um, Johnny, thank you. I've, I've got a ton of questions for you, um, but I do want to share the floor. I'm, I'm going to put Peter um, McPherson on the, on, the, on the spot first um, and tell us uh, why in, in 2003, 2004, uh, when this, this idea of a dividend and, and in case it's, it's not clear, what, we, what we've been talking about is that there would be a regular and universal uh, payment made to every either adult or every citizen um, paid directly out of the oil account uh, and published uh, on a regular basis and that this would be, this regularity would be enshrined either in the Constitution or in some, in some legal fashion so that the expectation, it wasn't uh, a gift Hopefully, we'll talk about the Libyan example uh, today, um, uh, but that it would it would become a regular expectation that would help to create some of that uh, some of that demand for accountability uh, that Johnny mentioned. But Peter, you, you were there in, in 2003 uh, at the time. Uh, could you could you tell us a little bit about 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 the the discussions at that time? Sure. Actually, let me go into something that I've never never seen published or written any place. It's a good history. That I, that I think people should have. I've been Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Treasury during the 80s, part of the 80s, and went to, uh, I was at Michigan State, and John Snow asked me to head the team of, of folks working on a set of financial and banking economic issues. The team was Australians, uh, English, and the U.S., and some others, but that was the core of the group. It was a very productive group, actually. Uh, if we'd had economic growth at all, if we'd had any uh, security, uh, this would have worked out very well, in my view. I mean, we did the new currency, for example. Uh, we, uh, working with the governing council, got the, the foreign investment law changed, so uh, you foreigners can have 51-plus investment, which I think is key around the world. 
the banking laws were changed, allowing uh, foreign banks to, to bring in technology investment and so on. And most of all that stuff is still there. Ambassador Crocker had me come over to uh, talk with a bunch of people just before he left uh, his position, and I went to uh, I went to the various ministries, looked at the thing. Virtually all the laws the governing council had adopted at the time are still there. Uh, almost no modifications by by the government since, which I particularly was intrigued that that was not the case, that there was no change, uh, significant change in the foreign investment law. Well, one of the things we didn't get done, though, ultimately. Uh, was to deal with this issue. I, I had a man by uh, Bill Block, who was still at the Treasury, and Block, uh, and he is now in Afghanistan, right? Uh, he's a Treasury uh, attaché uh, uh, in the mission, uh, an embassy there in, in Afghanistan, an extremely competent, uh, hardworking person. I, it was one of my favorite projects, so I was certainly involved, but uh, Bill was uh, principal drafter of this effort, and we put together a proposal uh, which basically followed track what, uh, what Johnny was explaining. We thought that, look, you've got, you've got these regional differences, and you need to get money to the regions. It can't be all spent in Baghdad. You've got uh, uh, intermittent populations within regions, you know, serious issues, and you if you can't just give them the money in regions and have the dominant whatever the region control, it has to really go to people. We thought it would be a huge, uh, a huge advantage to stability to get money to families, uh, to individuals. Uh, we thought too that uh, that it would stimulate economic growth with money in the economy. Uh, Brought, and in fact, there would be some investments and so forth. Uh, all the reasons, and, and really more than what you've described, it, it, it was a sound idea. Too much money at the center, uh, particularly mineral oil wealth, I think the world has seen is a mistake for democracy. And for those reasons, we put together this plan. Uh, I tried to, I, I, I don't. I didn't need a chance to review the plan once more. My friend Block, I didn't get a hold of him in time for him to send it to me. But uh, I basically it said, look, we don't have them. We know, remember this was the summer of 2003. We know the oil production is the level that we can, that we can uh, disperse this right now. But let's put in place a, a law. Uh, adopted by the governing council that says when production ex ex is up and above this level, uh, a certain uh, agreed upon percentage will be dispersed in this manner. We already had the food basket. Uh, the food basket still in place? Never will change. You got, we, we, we hope to get rid of This was every family, and they had excellent records. The Iraqis had good records in a lot. Of, I mean, if, you know, a lot of things. They were pretty good accountants. It's just a, Certain people at the top uh, could manipulate the whole process, but uh, uh, food basket, they got those out regularly. We would, if we hadn't gotten rid of the food basket before this came into place, we thought use the food basket methodology to get it out, and and if possible, send it through the banks. I I agreed with Johnny that this is the banks are a good way to do this. Well, the so. This proposal was put together. It was prospective, uh, but it, it, we didn't have all the data. Data wasn't the usual careful work. Was, it was to do something this big wasn't really uh, available to do in the summer of 2003 in Iraq. But we had enough data. And we put this together. Uh, I, was, I was sort of the economic liaison from to the governing council uh, by summer, uh, mid-late summer, when the governing council came into place. Uh, Jerry Bremer was, of course, there. Uh, Bremer worked hard presenting it to the governing council. I talked to a number of individual members of the governing council. The governing council didn't uh, vote against it. They just didn't vote which was their way 
of saying no. Uh, and it's true within uh, within the, uh, the within the Bremer group. Uh, everybody else said, "Well, it's not going to work." But but I my little team block uh, was super super strong about this. We we thought it was a we need to put in place. Uh, and to his great credit, uh, Bremer thought that was right. So we went back a second time. Lots of discussions back and forth. Uh, by the way, I thought the governing council quickly became like a, uh, like the Senate Finance Committee or something. I mean, they, I, I, I've done a lot of work on the Hill and back in the legislature in Michigan on getting my appropriations for Michigan State. And thoughtful, smart people, we began to broker and dicker like you always do in a, in a congressional legislative affair. In the end, they agreed. They passed it. They voted on it uh, without any significant dissent. They voted on it. Okay. Now, uh, but to ultimately get that done, we needed to get Washington to sign off on it. Uh, there had been a lot of interest in Washington. The Greenspan was very interested in this. Greenspan, in fact, had some elaborate plans on on how you would do this, combined with putting money in an investment fund a la Norway. Uh, Greenspan, ever very creative. Uh, my old boss, George Schultz, I know was interested in it. Uh, secretary Snow was deeply interested in it. Snow, unquestionably, of course, he was the secretary. Sent back to Washington. By this time, it was uh, late August, and uh, Washington knew. Now, I, I was there, and I can't tell you what the dynamics were. It is true that at the same time, we had before Congress a supplemental of many billions of dollars we were asking the U.S. government to provide to Iraq. It wasn't, didn't set quite the right tone, I suppose, but this was something that wasn't going to happen immediately. And it was uh, one of the true lost opportunities because I, I really believe <clears throat> that something passed by the governing council uh, would have had uh, some strength. It had been something to, to use in time ahead such as now. Mm -hmm. All right. Th thank you, Peter. That's uh, terrific. Uh, we, we have to get Bill to write this down, I think. Um, we uh, really do, actually. Yeah, I mean, we no, got a I lot mean of that. Stories there that we haven't ever. None of us, and we're always. Every one of us has been busy since. Yeah. But uh, there's a there's some some key economic <coughs> lessons, in my judgment, uh, that that we got out of that. My colleagues at Treasury and I and Bill, we need mm -hmm. to we need to write the story, not so much to advocate anything. It's been now almost eight years. But. Uh, uh, to write some lessons, mistakes. And, mm -hmm. and okay, I want to come back to Johnny about maybe what's changing in Iraq now that might make it more favorable and pol politically. But I did want to ask uh, uh, Abdul Rahim first. Um, you know, we have seen a couple of years ago, Gaddafi said uh, that he was going to write a check to every Libyan because they had a large budget uh, surplus one year. He never did that. Uh, Bahrain had, had talked about making a single payment to, to citizens, um, and we've seen uh, both India and Iran move from uh, subsidies to a targeted cash transfer system. Uh, so we're starting to see this idea uh, grow, I think, in, in certain places. Of course, this has been going on since the early 1980s in Alaska under a different context that maybe we can come back to. But I'm wondering if you're getting a view, taking a, a pan-Middle East view, if you're getting a sense that the idea of dividends or cash transfers to people uh, in these oil-rich economies where population maybe hasn't benefited as much and you've had very sclerotic uh, political systems, whether you're seeing any, uh, any increase in interest in this, in this, in this issue. Sure. I mean, I obviously can't talk about this in terms of hardcore economics because I'm not an economist, but I, I can certainly talk about the, the broad political contours of the issue. And you 
mentioned Libya, so I would like to follow your peregrination before I get to Iraq and talk about Libya. When things started to shake in uh, Libya uh, uh, in January, February, after Bir Ali of Tunisia fled, and I'm neither Iraqi nor Libyan, but I, I'm I'm Arab, and I and I do have a sense for what other Arabs may feel about certain issues. But at, at that time, I felt that if Al Qaddafi had handled the situation differently, things may have panned out differently in Libya. Uh, what do I mean by that? Instead of sending his son Saif al Islam. Uh, to threaten Libyans in that terrible speech, followed by his own terrible speech, talking about rats and wanting to cleanse uh, Libya uh, house by house and street by street. If he'd struck a conciliatory tone that dealt with the economics of the situation, he may have been able to uh, help the dynamics of that situation at that time uh, unfold differently. Because ultimately, uh, and I've, you know, I've, I've lived in, in the West long enough to see how things I've, I've done. I lived in, in Europe for about 14 years. I've lived in the US now for about 10 years. In, in, in both places, the, the, the theme of taxation and representation is obviously very, very strong and very powerful. And what most Arabs at that particular point in time, because the instinct has changed uh, somewhat in a way that I will uh, describe in a minute in the Arab world uh, since Bin Ali fled Tunisia. The instinct at that time was that everybody was resigned to the fact that uh, uh, Al-Qaddafi was going to hand power down to his son Saif al-Islam. Mubarak was going to hand uh, power down to his son uh, Gamal. Ali Abdullah Saleh in Yemen was going to hand power down to his son Ahmed. So what people were looking for, they were look, looking for a change in the economics. They wanted uh, money to eat and live decently and be able to send their children to, to, to schools with a, 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 a modicum guarantee of employment at the end of the educational process. And certainly Libya did have the means uh, to do that. This is a country of just a little under six million people, huge oil uh, revenues, uh, which as you know now are raising big questions as to what had he done with those huge revenues over 42 years. And I suppose that if he'd spoken, and I, I know from experience, I, I heard al-Qaddafi on many different occasions over the last few decades talk about doing just that, actually giving handouts, cash handouts, uh, from oil revenues to, to Libyans. If he tackled the situation in that perspective, uh, and, and I know that buying consent can be a, a very pejorative term, but <coughs> Libyans and Arabs generally were willing to accept that notion of actually giving their consent to their governments if they gave them cash handouts. He may have been able to at least delay the, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the, the eruption uh, in, in, in Libya. Now, bring that to Iraq. <coughs> the situation in Libya has never been half as complex and complicated as it is in, in Iraq in terms of uh, minorities and in terms of uh, the, the geographical divide between the north, the middle, and the south. Now that the spring, the Arab Spring, the so-called Arab Spring has, has happened, and I, I totally respect the argument that, that Johnny is making. Um, but I, I feel um, conflicted about it. Part of me wants to believe that giving people uh, uh, cash from oil revenues in Iraq would help keep Iraq together. Part of me, in light of the Arab Spring so far, tells me that the region has moved beyond the point where governments can just give people cash uh, and ask them to shut up. Prime example, Saudi Arabia. As soon as the Arab Spring started, things started to shake. 
the king of Saudi Arabia devoted $120 billion to buy consent uh, of the Saudis. In other words, to bribe uh, his own people. And, I mean, even in the West, that's what governments do. They buy consent. But you buy consent, and uh, Johnny mentioned the issue of taxation. You buy consent through taxation. You expand the taxation uh, 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 base. This is, a, this is a huge problem throughout the Arab world. People do not pay taxes. They do not look at their government through the prism of we are paying taxes, therefore we deserve to be politically uh, uh, represented. That conversation is already on the way in the Arab world today. And Iraq is not immune to it. I would even say, uh, I would go against the conventional wisdom in the Arab world that although a lot of Arabs do not agree with the invasion of Iraq of 2003, despite all the ostensibly nefarious uh, consequences of the invasion of 2003, the fact that Saddam was pulled out of a, a, a rabbit hole had something to do, uh, I venture to say, with what's going on now in the Arab world, because a lot of people realized he cannot defend the nation against outside aggression. He can only kill his own people. And they extrapolating to Arabs are extrapolating to, the, to, to their leaders now. So now you have that conversation about representation in the Arab world. And uh, Johnny mentioned the, the, the key word in all this, citizenship. People want to be treated as citizens. They do not want to be bribed. They'll take the bribe. If you, if you give Iraqis $200, $250 a month, or Libyans, or Moroccans, or Algeria, they'll take the bribe. But ultimately, that bribe will not be enough to uh, dampen the conversation about political representation. In the case of Iraq, I doubt if medium to long term it would help, hmm. apart from creating huge inflation problems if you gave uh, people uh, cash handouts. I doubt if me uh, medium to long term it would uh, bring uh, Iraqis around the idea that they should stay together as one country just because they're receiving uh, $200, $250 uh, each from oil revenue. Okay. I was going to go to Andy, but I'm actually going to ask Johnny uh, if he wants to come back. Uh, on this point, I know that, that Johnny made the point that the idea um, of having a regular dividend was not a discretionary political bribe, but that it was going to be embedded in rights because the idea was that you were trying to create this link uh, of accountability. Um, and I think maybe here I'll just mention, I was just reading um, an un, uh, unfinished manuscript uh, by Jay Hammond, who was the governor of Alaska from 1974 to 82, mm. who came up with the idea of the Alaska Permanent Dividend Fund. And he, he pushed this idea where all Alaskan residents uh, receive an annual check, which is half of the earnings that the, uh, that the, uh, that the Sovereign Wealth Fund of the state earns e each year. He didn't do it because Alaskans were poor, but he was actually doing it because he thought that Alaskans we're just receiving federal transfers, and the state was spending money on bridges to nowhere and these bad projects, and he wanted to try to create a demand, Johnny's football stadium analogy, in, in Alaska, where every Alaskan would pay attention to exactly what was going on in the state budget as a constraint on corruption and state waste. Um, and I think in hindsight, it's now, uh, it's now almost 20 years later, I think it's, it's worked relatively well. Uh, there's an interesting contrast between federal transfers that Alaska gets, and they're notorious for spending those on bridges to nowhere, but state funds that belong to the state and that are tied to the dividend, people watch like a hawk. Uh, and they want to know why they got $1,200 this year and it was 1300 last year. Um, but I didn't know, Johnny, if you had, mm. if you had uh, uh, um, uh, a response to Abdurrahim. Uh, Yes, I, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with the idea that, um, you know, the, uh, the Arab world has moved on, so there's not really a possibility of a, of a you know, patronage-driven social contract, um, which is why the title of my book is Karama, mm, which, which means honor or dignity. Um, but I would disagree with that as being a characterization of what the dividend is or could be, and as I say, I think the devil is in the detail. I think there's, there's just... Uh, you know, um, 
there's all the difference in the world between um, what appears to be a, a similar act of, you know, a transfer of money from a government to people, uh, dependent on whether it is at the discretion or whim, and what everybody understands that it is at the discretion <coughs> or whim or munificence of the ruler, or it is written into a law and, and into a constitution which is available to anybody to read, uh, I, I think is all the difference in the world. Um, and so I, I just make that general point. And then with regard to inflation, uh, that's a manageable issue. There's no question that you would risk inflation. But first of all, that can't be the primary concern because one of the best in, you know, one of the best ways to deal with natural resource wealth if you're concerned about inflation is for the ruler to steal it all and put it in the Cayman Islands. You've got zero inflation there. <laughs> you know. uh, but, um, and it really depends on the management of it. So if you're um, um, at $200, you're talking about $3.5 billion going into the economy. Um, but in, in a, that's a small percentage of GDP. And um, you, as Peter said, it's money not going to the centre, it's going out. So you could, that could be as much driven by... It, can, it could stimulate demand um, and entrepreneurial activity as much as it could have an inflationary effect. It depends on other factors. So, uh, sure, sure. I mean, I, I think Johnny may be absolutely right, especially about the issue of inflation not being the, the, the primary concern. In, in fact, I do agree that, that inflation would not be the primary concern. Mm. My concern is, is twofold. One is that what Iraq needs in the same way as what Libya needs, what Tunisia needs, what Morocco needs, it needs huge investment in infrastructure. Because if you give me whatever name you choose to call it, you give me $250, $350 in Iraq, in today's Iraq, it's a lot of money. Today's Arab world, $250 is a lot of money. If you give me that, rather than invest in the kind of uh, infrastructure that the country really needs to cement it together, it seems to me, even if you have that legislated for, the, the, the dividend, and, and, and voted on by parliament, I, my sense is that it would still be pouring water in the sand. That's the first layer of it. The second layer of it, which is the bigger concern, is that one rife problem that all these countries suffer from uh, in North Africa and the Middle East is corruption. So you could have the country's revenue from oil, $120 billion in the case of uh, Iraq, for example, all you want. Unless you tackle the problem of corruption, the black hole, giving people a dividend from uh, 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 oil revenue even if it's legislated for, I think it's not going to take the country far down the road of development. And worse, I do not see how it would dampen the kind of resentment, regional uh, mm -hmm. resentment that Johnny rightly talked about in the case of, uh, uh, of Iraq and <coughs> help Iraqis come around. And there are a lot of Iraqis, by the way, who want to keep Iraq uh, uh, unified. But there are a lot of others who do not want to keep it uh, mm -hmm. unified. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that may not necessarily be a compelling uh, yeah. argument for them to do so. Okay. I don't know if Charles, Charles Kenny's here, but he's always uh, quick to remind us that, uh, um, that infrastructure and, and the large construction sector is one of the most uh, uh, corrupt mm -hmm. uh, and most corrupted sectors. So if you're worried about... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, if you wanted to spend a lot of money and waste it on corruption, putting it into large infrastructure projects is a pretty good way to do it. But I don't want to let Andy off the, off the hook here. Uh, I thought it was really interesting that Peter said that the blockage back in 2003 was actually Washington. Of course, Washington's influence on uh, decision-making in Baghdad much, much diminished um, today than it was. But there's clearly a very strong U.S. interest in helping to encourage a more stable and prosperous Iraq in the future. And this massive increase in oil production that Johnny uh, described uh, is both a, 
opportunity, but also obviously should be making Treasury and other uh, USG officials nervous. So what's your, um, what's your, uh, uh, your assessment of how well Iraq is positioned to manage these revenues, and what extent is the U.S. still engaged um, on influencing uh, Iraqi economic policy? Thanks, Todd. Uh, those are good questions. Uh, I think, to begin with, I'd say, as, as you pointed out, our uh, ability to influence Iraqi officials is greatly reduced over the last, uh, well, since Peter was there. Uh, I've been personally working on Iraq for about four years, and it's greatly, greatly reduced over that, that time period. Uh, but one thing that has continued is, is our focus on uh, helping Iraq manage its resources more effectively. Uh, and I think that has started from the very beginning when Peter was there with, with a fairly large uh, Treasury team. Uh, we've had a significant Treasury presence in Iraq uh, for the four years that I've been working on it. It's been our either our biggest or our second biggest uh, technical assistance um, country in the world uh, for years. And uh, a lot of that is focused on public helping Iraq manage its uh, public finances, uh, its um, monetary policy, et cetera. Um, but, uh, you know, Iraq started from a very weak position on, uh, on management of its uh, fiscal position. All of its um, budgeting back in the day was largely done on paper and uh, you know, there were very few um, qualified people in, in the ministries, and um, many of them are, were targeted uh, by insurgents. So it's been a very difficult uh, challenge to uh, help the Iraqis uh, strengthen their management of public finances. Um, it's still part of uh, the agenda. It's still part of uh, Iraq's uh, ongoing IMF program. Uh, which aims, for example, to uh, move the Iraqis to uh, set up a single treasury account so they can manage their spending uh, more effectively rather than have uh, a large number of spending units all throughout the country. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been the subject of a, a number of uh, interventions as well from the World Bank, which also has been working on, on public financial management with the Iraqis. Looking, looking to the future, uh, clearly, with uh, oil production ramping up, as Johnny has described, uh, helping Iraq figure out a way to manage these resources effectively will be uh, is, is a critical task. Certainly, a very high priority for us. We I was talking to my team just yesterday about what what we want to do with Iraq over the next year, and this is uh, sort of at the top of the list: is um, help Iraq uh, manage its budget uh, effectively. I think there's a, there's a number of ideas. I think this, this idea is uh, an intriguing one. I think there's um, you know, a number of pros and cons associated with it. Uh, I think one of the, one of the key alternatives uh, would be um, a system where Iraq would save its revenues rather than uh, spend it. And obviously, these things are not mutually exclusive could do some combination, but having some sort of system where Iraq sets up some sort of sovereign wealth fund, stabilization fund, oil um, fund of some sort would be a, uh, an, another alternative that helps address some of the issues that have been raised already, such as corruption. Obviously, you don't want monies to be stolen and sent to the Cayman Islands, but if they're uh, budgeted and sent to uh, investment accounts that are also relatively transparent, that's, uh, that's a reasonable alternative and helps get away from inflation pressures and other things. Um, but to come back to your, to your question, I think uh, you know, our ability to influence the, the Iraqis is, is limited. Uh, our uh, ability is really driven by what sort of ideas we have, not what sort of leverage we have. So we need to have good ideas to present to the Iraqis so that they see it's, uh, it makes sense from them, both economically and politically, to move forward uh, with improvements in, in managing oil revenues. Great. Thanks, Andy. Um, in, in a second, I'm going to throw it open to the audience. So while you're thinking of, of questions for, for our panelists, I'm, I'm just going to ask Johnny, 
at the end of the paper, you come to a really, um, uh, uh, you, you have an, a, I, I thought, really fascinating discussion about the changing political dynamics inside Iraq. And something that we have found working on this idea is that you get very strange bedfellows. So this is uh, the idea of cash transfers is hugely popular in parts of uh, populist uh, European circles. It's hugely popular in some libertarian circles. And so we've often found uh, unexpected groups coming together around, around this idea. And, and you mentioned uh, that al Sadr um, in, in Iraq has been talking a about this and, and advocating a, a, a dividend. Could you just talk a little bit about, about that and whether that's part of this window? It's not just the oil production increase, but changing political ideas in Iraq? Sure. Um, yes. Um, the, uh, yes, Muqtada al-Sadr has been um, um, talking about this for some time. Uh, and, of course, they're now coalition partners in the, in the Maliki government. And Nouri al-Maliki himself, um, in February, March, you know, Iraq saw <clears throat> some quite um, uh, sizable demonstrations, you know, inspired by the Arab Spring in Egypt and Tunisia. Um, and there were some deaths, and it looked for a time as though uh, a protest movement could kick off in Iraq and really gather steam. And at that stage, Maliki himself started talking about making a, uh, making a distribution. Um, and, for example, they cancelled you know, defense spending plans and started to look again at uh, food rations and so on. Um, but it does, as you say, Todd, it, it brings to mind, it's another instance of, of actually quite radically different political philosophies being very close together in the steps they're considering, because I would argue that a uh, measured, integrated, uh, um, market-friendly implementation of a dividend is extremely different, although it looks the same, you know, it looks uh, to, to uh, you know, populist politics driving it. Um, uh, um, and that's the reason I would say in, in, in response to the question about infrastructure and corruption is, is that the, and for that matter stabilization it, it funds and sovereign wealth funds is that the dividend is not uh, instead of, it is a means to, it is a means to uh, 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 tackling corruption, it is, it is a means to more effective public expenditure, you know. 10%, I mean, the, the, the margin for improvement of efficiency, I would guess, in public spending in Iraq is greater than 10%. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's not designed as either or. And um, between 80 billion and 130 billion, there's plenty of room for stabilization and sovereign wealth fund and dividend as well. Okay. All right, can I, uh, we're going to throw it open. Can I ask people, please, please identify yourself. Uh, and please, um, uh, please have a question uh, or a brief comment. Uh, I'm going to ask Stephanie to uh, to be uh, tough with the microphone. So, Stephanie, can we take um, right, right right in front of you? Hi, I'm Ann Richard with the International Rescue Committee, and we're concerned about displaced Iraqis, both inside their country and also refugees in uh, neighboring states. And um, a lot of displaced Iraqis uh, can't register for the benefits to which they are entitled now. And so their government is not giving them the support that they ought to be getting right now. And so I wonder if this suggests that they just don't have their act together to undertake such a large uh, program along the lines of which you outline. One uh, positive example from this humanitarian crisis that potentially bolsters what you're saying is that the High Commissioner for Refugees and I, uh, some of the Red Crescent societies, I think, are able to help refugees in the neighboring countries using uh, cash transfers, uh, using uh, ATM cards, especially since there's, you know, uh, ATM uh, shelters, whatever they're called, uh, all over big cities. And so that has led to cutting down on corruption in terms of aid delivery. Okay. I think, um, I think I'm going to take a cluster of, of questions. So can we take, take here? 
Hi, I'm Lacey Schmeidler. I'm unaffiliated. And I just uh, I had a question for Mr. West. Could you speak to some of the political benefits that you discussed and how lower levels of literacy, I think UNICEF estimates the literacy rate in Iraq is something around the upper 70s, lower 80s, and the levels of financial education is going to impact the average citizen's ability to kind of provide the oversight that you're saying is going to be one of the political benefits to this dividend. If people have lower education rates, um, their ability to critically examine some of the, the government's budgetary actions, I feel like, would be diminished. And if you could maybe speak to that a little bit. Okay. We have here, and then we'll go back there, and then we'll come back to the panel. <clears throat> Gordon Johnson. I'm a retired businessman and uh, came to Washington to work in the Marshall Plan. I got involved in retirement in privatization under an AID contract when privatization was not in the dictionary in 1985. Um, and at, we never got to privatize an oil company. We got to privatize a lot of other things, but no government wants to privatize their oil, their oil revenues, which leads to the question that uh, you talked about uh, bribing the people, which basically comes down to the mental. It, we're talking about mind changing because your attitude, your point is that the government, the oil belongs to the government, and the government is then bribing the people. In a sense, what we have to do, it seems to me, and you may comment on how do we change the attitude of people to recognize that the oil belongs to the people. It's, and I think in the, trans, in, the, in the transition national law, they did say oil revenues belong, the oil belongs to the people. I guess in, in the Muslim religion, it belongs to God. Anything under the ground belongs to God. So who is God is another question for Muslims to sort out. But uh, it's the mental, it, it's the mindset. And you said we've got to do ideas and, and not, not just economics. And it's this idea of the oil belongs to the people. And could, you, never, you haven't commented, perhaps you would, on the idea that if we could do this, what would the repercussions be for Saudi Arabia and for Iran, and if you look at the oil problem we have, it's not. People think it's our oil that we're there for. I, I think the administration really failed when they never pointed out that it isn't the oil that's critical; it's the money that comes from the oil and how they spend it. It was how Saddam spent his money, not that he had the oil money. It was how he spent it. On, on, on prisons and, and uh, all the things that you, the intelligence service, all the things he did to oppress his people. Uh, it wasn't the oil that was bad. So we were there to change the way the oil money was spent. The Saudis are worse with the way they spend their money on madrasas and mosques for Wahhabism. The Iranians are worse with the way they spend their money. So I think you've missed, in terms of, as I read your paper, there wasn't enough, perhaps, emphasis on the impact that this could have to change the paradigm of who owns the oil. In Saudi Arabia, in, in all over, in, 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 we haven't mentioned Venezuela, where one candidate proposed a credit card to give out his, every, everybody would get a credit card and the government would just put money in their credit cards. But anyway. Okay, thank you. Got one more uh, at, the, at the back. Hey, my name is Matt Benson. I'm with the um, International Center uh, for Tax and Development at the University of Sussex um, the at the IDS, the Institute of Development Studies. My question is for Johnny West. Um, so I'm really curious. There's two questions, actually. So what are the elite incentives for people to begin giving cash transfers out in Iraq? Um, I'm looking at some, some of these issues in South Sudan, so it's kind of... It's I, I'm sorry, just what are the what incentives? Elite incentives. Why, elite. Why, why bother with cash transfers? Why give up control over some of the resources of the center? And then the second part of the question is actually who's... In, I mean... In a state where not everybody is, is fond of the central government, why is there some backlash against biometric um, identification? And, and if so, could you elucidate a bit more of that, or perceptions of biometric um, identification? Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to give uh, uh, Peter first. We'll, we'll come down the line. Peter, feel free to uh, tackle or avoid any of those uh, questions or comments, and then we'll we'll just work our way this way. Uh, 
lot of professional conflicts. The Iraqis could handle the distribution of the food of the food basket nicely. Uh, I'm confident that a distribution of, of oil money could work very efficiently. And I, I think that's, uh, let me just make that point. It goes to much of the discussion here. Okay, thank you. Abdelharim? I mean, I, I, I wanted to uh, comment on some of the issues that you mentioned. I have to be honest and tell you that now you told me you're associated with the Marshall Plan, I feel kind of intimidated talking about <laughs> these, <laughs> these, these issues. But, I mean, the, number one, the issue of privatization in the Arab world generally. Um, I, I also have to be honest and say I'm not quite sure how privatization has actually worked in Iraq p post-2003. But as a general rule, privatization in, in the Arab world is a, is a funny business because most of the time, and Johnny can perhaps confirm this, most of the time in the Arab world when you talk about the private sector, you actually talk about either the head of state or people who are related to the head of state hiding behind uh, the, 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 the private sector facade. So it is the private sector, but it's in fact the public sector. It's not the <laughs> private sector in the sense that we know it here in, 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 the, Uni in the United States or in, in, in the West at, at large. Who owns oil and Islam? I mean, even in Saudi Arabia, where they say that they apply you know, God's word uh, on, on earth, when it comes to money and oil, it has nothing to do about religion or, or Islam. It, it, the cash nexus is the cash nexus. And the way they, they deal with it, uh, whether in Saudi Arabia or, or, or Iran or Algeria or any other uh, oil producing country, has nothing to do with God. It, 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 has, it has to do about them acting as if they actually own uh, that money, not given to them uh, by God, they, they, they've given it to themselves and they, they feel that they can do with it whatever they want to do with it. They can buy the consent of the people in whatever way, shape or form they see fit. It, 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 and, and, and then you, you have the issue of the, the, the populace at large, which does not always see uh, life in, in, in terms of, the, in, through the prism of, of Islam or, or, or any other religion when it comes to uh, economics. Oil, is oil a, a blessing or a curse? Um, is also a, a, another issue that I wanted to, since you mentioned what the Saudis do with the, with, with the, with the money, uh, with the madrasas uh, in various parts of the world. Yes, I, I, I do accept that argument, but if you compare what the Saudis and generally the Gulf states have done with oil money with what North oil producing countries in North Africa have done with oil money. Libya is a prime example. I mean, Libya, and I hope I'm not exaggerating, but based on my own experience in Libya, Libya is a, has handled oil money in a disastrous way. It, it's, a, it, it's a catastrophe. There's no infrastructure, there's, there's, there's nothing. Whereas you go to Saudi Arabia, you go to uh, uh, some of the other Gulf states, there is an impressive uh, 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 infrastructure. Does that mean that there is no corruption? No, there's, there's massive corruption, but at least they have something to show for part of uh, the, 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 oil, uh, the oil revenue. And just a, a final point on changing the, the mentality. You know, when things started happening in, in Tunisia and then uh, Egypt, especially Egypt. A lot of people started talking about revolution in, in the, the Arab world and, and the Middle East. I still feel a little queasy, not queasy, I still feel a little skittish about using the term revolution because revolution is about changing, it's, it's, it's transformative process, the kind that you are referring to. We have not begun to see real signs of that in the Arab world, even in, in Egypt. I mean, look at Libya and the way they've dealt with anybody <coughs> who's black in, in Libya. It just tells you, or the way that Qaddafi may have been killed today, it just tells you that people are still too concerned with the short-term change, which they're absolutely justified to do. But people have not begun 
to take that wider uh, look on how we transform uh, societies in ways that would create better uh, uh, accountability, better people holding the government accountable, uh, especially in terms of literacy and, and, and illiteracy that you mentioned there. Okay, thank you. Andy? Uh, thanks. I'll talk briefly about the first couple questions. Uh, first, I agree with uh, Peter McPherson that I think Iraq would be able to implement some sort of uh, cash dividend if they choose to. I think their issues with refugees and things like that is, is more a matter of their priorities and choices than a sign that they're uh, not capable <coughs> of, of, of doing things. Um, I do think it would be complicated in Kurdistan as to how they implement it, how the Kurds want to implement it if, if it was a national program and, and how they would play ball. I think that would be an interesting question. Um, on the second question about uh, the Iraq, Iraqi level of education, would that sort of minimize the oversight? I think that's a, a valid point. I guess, uh, let me guess how Johnny, Johnny would answer that, which is that he's looking to have a uh, soccer stadium full of, of people and they're certainly well educated uh, enough to fill a, to fill more than uh, <laughs> more than a couple of soccer stadiums. So I think that's still okay. <laughs> There's very little left for me to say. I think actually. Um, Yes, uh, yeah, on the mechanics, I mean, there's any number of different kinds of mechanics available. Um, there's the public distribution system to which the World Bank estimates over 99% of Iraqis inside the country um, are subscribed to. There's the electoral roll, which is, you know, a little bit dogged in places, but has seen the country through five electoral processes. There's uh, mobile cash <coughs> transfer systems in wide use already. And we also know from a bunch of other countries that you know, introducing new systems, I mean, such as in India, you know, um, they, they've, they've got most of the way through a biometric ID system in much more difficult logistical circumstances for a much bigger uh, population um, uh, relatively quickly. So, um, uh, I, yes, and Andy's also absolutely right. I mean, that is my answer really about the football stadium. The football stadium. I have a friend who's a fundraiser here, and he talks about grass tops uh, as opposed to grass roots. The football stadium are the grass tops. It, uh, the British example of this is we, there's a uh, you know a, a character in British political culture called disgusted of Tunbridge Wells, and uh, Tunbridge <laughs> Wells is this place where nothing ever happens because everybody's very rich and comfortable. But people in Tunbridge Wells write venomous letters to newspapers. Uh, you know, protesting about um, you know the the uh, rubbish collection or, or or you know the museum's displays are very shoddy and you know whatever you happen to 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 to, to think of. Um, uh, the football stadium is actually full of disgusted of Tunbridge Wells. It's not full of the twenty percent plus of people that can't um, read or write. Um, Privatization is an interesting one. I, I would put very strong emphasis on the fact that the, the dividend is absolutely neutral to the question of ownership of the oil industry. It's absolutely neutral to it. The two are completely separate um, <coughs> issues. Um, and it's, a, you know, it's an interesting question. It's a question, of course, which people are already starting to ask in the context of Libya. My, my own view is that... Um, that um, the political consensus around national control and ownership of those resources is so strong it would be folly to, 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 to try and mess with it. And I also, as it happens, believe that the arguments for efficiency are marginal uh, and case to case. Uh, um, and, uh, I, and simply because you're dealing with uh, rent as opposed to uh, as, as opposed to profit-driven industry. I'm not an advocate of state ownership of industries in general. Um, uh, but um, it, it's very, very marginal. And um, we're seeing, I mean, you know, look at Petrobras. I mean, Brazil, so Brazil's drive out of uh, poverty, its rise to regional <coughs> superpower status has been driven by oil, and oil has been run by Petrobras, which was... Uh, had one of the largest flotations last year, but remains a majority government-owned uh, company, Petronas in Malaysia, um, 
we may not like how Chinese natural resource companies operate in Africa, but in terms of their mandate of the Chinese public interest, they're very effective. Um, so I, you know, I think that should be. It's an interesting question, but it, it should. It's a very separate one from the question of a of a dividend. And as regards lead incentives, um, there. Well, there is this populist pressure in, in Iraq right now, as, as we mentioned, from not only Muqtada al-Sadr and Nouri al-Maliki, but a number of the other Shia parties in particular. Um, in general, you can identify windows. So the question is, I mean. In many cases, you might be talking about trying to cut government spending to create the margin for uh, a, a dividend, not in the case of Iraq. So then the question is, who would ever agree to that? Um, so then you're looking at windows such as elections, where a candidate is looking for uh, you know, a popular policy. It could also be incumbency in, in countries where there are term limits and somebody's looking for somebody's legacy shopping. Um, there are many countries in which subsidies are the window. Egypt spends more on fuel subsidies than it does on health and education services combined. And the fuel subsidies are anti-poor. Middle class people and rich people benefit far more from those subsidies than poor people do. And that's also the case in Syria. It's also the case in Yemen. So that's another window. Um, early stage producers are another window. So. Um, there are a bunch of circumstances in which it's conceivable that, that those arguments could get play. Okay, I'm going to just take two, two more uh, quick questions. I'll take the two uh, here in the front. I'm going to ask you to please be extremely brief. Zon? Mm -hmm. um, Jordan Selman, Office of Iraq Affairs, USAID. Uh, just a couple of things. That I think this is a great idea. Um, going on the PDS, this would actually put money back into the system instead of spending the money going externally for expensive foreign goods, basically. Um, I have a question of the uh, implementation, though. There are a lot of political problems that go around this, and you, none of you seem to mention the their act, Rock actually does have a national development plan in place, which was approved by the Ministry of Planning, and yet they haven't moved forward with that. The hydrocarbons law has been on uh, been debated since 2005. They are having problems paying the international oil companies. The payments to the Kurdistan regional government for their oil have been lagging. The um, fuel subsidies to the population for electricity for the local generators, problems on delivering on that. Um, and also there would be a need for a redoing the census to you know, get a whole idea of where all the, where the people are, which brings up the disputed internal boundaries with the KRG again. And um, I'm just curious as to how you would kind of push this forward. What would be your idea for, for moving forward these, uh, mm -hmm. this system would you, would you have? Good questions. Last question. Make it a good one. <laughs> well, I don't know how good it is. I'm, uh, my name is Lynn Gallagher. I'm a uh, consultant on the World Bank contract on public finance to the Ministry of Finance, uh, helping them on their uh, budget execution. For the government of Iraq. The government of Iraq, yeah, and uh, was just came back from a few weeks there. And uh, uh, my observations are that uh, they, they're they a long way from having any mobile money. Uh, we did talk about this with the central bank, and uh, they're curious about it, but uh, uh, dissemination is a bit of a difficulty. But I was wondering if, um, uh, Johnny West, you said something about 10% efficiencies. Of, I know that 90% of the budget, the national budget, comes from the oil revenues. And uh, I've so, you know, looked, obviously, at how is it expended. And the uh, DG for accounting spoke publicly at our meeting, and he talked not about sort of the efficiency of the budget, but how he's getting money to the teachers, to the army, to the, you know, to the people. And he was very focused on this in this sort of you know, small meeting we were having. So. Um, it seems to me that they're <clears throat> quite efficient, as Peter McPherson said. They have a very qualified accounting people and the Supreme Board of Auditors and the Ministry of Finance. Uh, but I think, yeah, given right, right now, they're already sort of in a deficit. So the increase in the oil production will be you know, most welcome. And I think there are major opportunities for, uh, for investment. The country desperately does need more investment, and there's not much of an investment budget going on right now. 
it's all basically an operating budget. But I wasn't um, sure about your, your comment about 10% efficiency, and I was wondering if you could clarify that. Okay, I think I'm gonna, uh, I, want, I do wanna end on time, so I'm gonna actually ask Johnny uh, to maybe respond to those. Uh, any last words, and then we'll close. I think that our, our, our panelists will, will be here for any last burning questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to them. Uh, so, so, Johnny. Um, um, yes, so the issue of, of um, all of these suspended issues <coughs> within the oil industry, there is actually a section in the paper which talks about, um, it describes them briefly, and again, I think it's a question of um, helping to improve oversight. The hydrocarbons laws, um, you may remember, were one of the four milestones that the Bush administration set as conditions for withdrawal, and they're still, um, the hydrocarbon laws still haven't been passed. There's now uh, an oil and gas committee um, in parliament which has teeth and is run by somebody who occupied a senior position before, so he's carving out territory by opposing the government um, the issue of payments with KRG continues and so on. So, but you don't, it was, I would describe the overall situation of governance within the industry as agreed confusion um, and muddling along. Um, I would suggest that actually a dividend of this kind would help to resolve those issues because you need, one, once people have a stake in the industry being run, um, there's an increase in pressure and it, it actually cuts both ways. Um, oppositionists in terms of people who oppose government policy for whatever reason uh, um, would then be in a position themselves of pressure to provide a constructive and better alternative, which isn't the case when there is no uh, I I possibility of influencing debate. Um, so um, that's how I would frame those Issues. I mean, th I think those are. I mean, they're very valid points and, and very um, um, troubling um, because the, it, the the I think we're in a situation where everybody agrees to keep talking stuff up, and so far there are no major problems. But there really isn't resolution of the regulatory aspects of the industry or the. Uh, I think we really don't understand the nature of the agreements between the government and the IOCs either. Uh, um, um, as far as the uh, 10 percent and paying teachers and so on, I mean, that's a culture of patronage politics, actually. Um, um, what I meant by 10 percent is simply if you've got a, um, um, you know, $80 billion at the moment and possibly $120 billion coming, if, if you choose to spend 10 percent of it or less, in other words, you're diminishing um, uh, the money available to government by 10 percent, but you increase the efficiency of the use of the remaining 90 percent, um, you know, public infrastructure or whatever the mixture of capital and operating expenditures the government chooses to deploy is <coughs> improved by the dividend, not diminished. Again, we're looking, money is not money is not money. Smart money, you know, five dollars of smart money is better than twenty dollars of dumb money. Um, um, just, um, uh, but the, that approach, I mean, it's basically the approach of the wazifa, uh, um, which is, you know, I define distributing uh, income by the number of people on my payroll. Uh, but we see right there that that is not in any sense a productive, I mean, in, in, in the most literal use of the word, a productive definition of the economy. Um, I, I, am I successful if the government is... And, and so Iraq's possibilities as security issues go down and hopefully stay down, I mean, obviously there are serious ongoing security issues, but we are in a completely different situation than we were, in a better situation than we were. Um, actually, it ends up looking like, you know, maybe some kind of Gulf state, maybe some kind of Saudi Arabia, where, um, in fact... Um, I would say without a dividend, the kind of issues and problems that Abdul Rahim is suggesting of, you know, governments buying people simply because they employ enough of them and they pay them enough, uh, and in return they, and in Iraq you rotate a little bit between Shia and Sunni and Kurds and communists and liberals and so on. Um, um, that's where we're headed, and so how many, 
how many people are on the government payroll, I would say, is not a, a you know a, 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 a strong positive indicator of 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 um, re real public use of of the natural resource wealth. Great. Uh, well, I, w I just want to flag. I know this is there, there's a lot of rich issues here on the technology side, on the politics, on the economics, uh, on the structure of the oil sector. Um, we do have on our, on our website uh, on the initiatives page for oil to cash a lot of this work that will that some of it's come out. A lot of it will be rolling out over the next couple of months. I do want to point you to a paper by uh, our colleague Alan Gelb, which looks specifically at biometric identification technologies and how these can work in some very difficult uh, and already are working in some very difficult environments, much more difficult than, than even Iraq. Um, and we've got uh, a number of country case studies. Uh, the Iraq paper by Johnny is just one in a series. We've already had Uganda and Ghana come out. We'll have uh, Venezuela, Equatorial Guinea, Liberia, Papua New Guinea. Uh, our colleagues over at the Revenue Watch Institute in New York will have case studies on East Timor, Bolivia, and Mongolia. Um, and several of us will continue to, to watch uh, this trend and develop the ideas. If you want to um, follow it, if you're on Twitter, there's a hashtag, oil number two cash, oil to cash. Uh, but we uh, will we'll continue to, to, to look at this issue uh, here at the center. Uh, but I do want to thank uh, Johnny, uh, Andy, Peter, and Abdul Rahim for a really terrific discussion uh, and one uh, conversation I think we're still just getting started. So thank you.